on the 7th of March 1924 to claim the Khilafah for himself. But when your client state of Britain, you can't do that. You have to first apply to the British government for permission <laughs> to become the Khalifa. Hmm? He didn't do that. As soon as Sharif al Hussein claimed the Khilafat for himself on the 7th of March 1924, you're going to get all of this information in that book which is outside the Caliphate, the Hijaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. As soon as he did that, Britain gave the green light to Abdul Aziz. Attack. Within six months, the Saudi uh, the, uh, 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 army of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud conquered Makkah. And Abdul Aziz uh, and Sharif Hussein packed his suitcase and off he went. British took him away. This one the Americans will take out of Jordan. And so Abdul Aziz ibn Saud is now in control of Makkah and eventually Medina. It's a Saudi Wahhabi alliance. Does he claim the Khilafah for himself now? No. What he does is, as soon as he enters Makkah in 1924, October, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud makes a proclamation and they're going to hate me for revealing this to you. Because nobody remembers it now. The proclamation which he makes is that this land belongs to the entire Ummah. Huh? This land belongs to the entire Ummah. I wonder how a Pakistani or a Bengali Muslim will feel when he hears that and he's been rounded up like dogs, stray dogs and put on trucks because he's overstayed his visa while white-skinned Americans and British are treated like princes in the Holy Land. How would a Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi feel? This land belongs to the entire Ummah. And it is for the Ummah, not for Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, for the Ummah to establish the government which will rule over this land. That is his proclamation in 1924. But in cricket it's called playing for time. He did this because in April of 1924, Al-Azhar University had responded to the Turkish abolition of the Khilafah. What did they do? Al-Azhar University declared that this was bid'ah and haram to abolish the Khilafah. Hmm? And therefore, we must respond to it. And the response of Al-Azhar is that we must have a mu'tamar, a conference which would meet and which would appoint a new Khalifa. As soon as Al-Azhar issued this proclamation, you could see how Britain was trembling. The British government can't digest their food now. They've got to plan some counter strategy to the initiative of Al-Azhar University. The counter strategy is that Egypt is itself not a free country. It may appear free, but Britain really has control over Egypt. So Britain puts pressure on King Fuad, the father of King Farouk. You're too old to hear about, you're too young to know about this. And King Fa'ud, uh, Fuad is now putting pressure on Al Azhar to hold back on this conference. Hmm? So for two years, the conference can't take place. Two years because of British pressure. The conference finally takes place in June, July of 1926. But Britain uses another counter strategy. She gets Abdul Aziz ibn Saud in Makkah to also convene a conference of the world of Islam in Makkah at the time of the Hajj, which is May of 1926. And then Britain and Russia and France and China and all the major powers in Europe all get to work. Massive intervention in the affairs of the world of Islam to ensure that the Cairo conference does not succeed in winning a representative gathering. And that the Makkah conference gets all the Muslims attending it. And they succeeded. The Cairo conference, organized by Al-Azhar University, becomes an essentially Arab conference. 
because non-Arabs are hardly present. The conference met. The conference decided that the Khilafah was an essential part of the deen, that it was bid'ah and haram to abolish it, that the Khilafah must be restored, but we don't know how to do it. So let's go back home and come back after one year. That was the decision. We don't know how to do it. But in Mecca, you had the most successful representation of the entire world of Islam, because Britain really went to work on it. This conference is now convened, but strangely for the Wahhabi movement, strangely for the Wahhabi movement, which is a religious movement, which declares that it is bringing back the original Islam and removing all the extraneous things which had been added and cutting out all the shirk. So this is the rare Islam. Well, then how come you don't even have the subject of the Khilafah in your agenda for your conference? We asked the Wahhabi movement, give us an answer. There is no answer. The answer is that the Wahhabi Saudi Alliance is now perpetrating a gigantic, a massive betrayal of Islam in abandoning the Khilafah. And so the conference takes place. But the subject of the Khilafah is not even on the agenda of the conference. Instead, Abdulaziz ibn Saud approaches the conference twice himself in person and he asks the conference to recognize him as al-malik <laughs> that his rule should be recognized over the hijaz when the conference had heard his majesty the king on both occasions and the conference is now sitting down to discuss the matter Shall we recognize Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz? The leader of the Indian Muslim delegation jumped up to speak first. He spoke first. His name was Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar. He got up and he told the king, get lost. We'll never do that. As soon as the leadership of the Indian Muslim delegation had established his position of rejecting the claim of the Saudi Wahhabi leadership for sovereignty and control over the Hijaz, the rest of the delegates couldn't say, mm. that was the power of a man who knew Islam and lived Islam. And so the conference ended without giving to the Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz recognition. They decided that they'll meet every year, but that was the last time they ever met. This then was the response of the world of Islam to the abolition of the Khilafah.